I'm the director of employment community engagement for the division. This is a second um, uh, webinar that we've done on the employment paper reporting data collection. The last one was completed last week and at the conclusion of this webinar, I will post the link where you can uh, view uh, either a recording of today's webinar or last week's uh, in case you need to share it with other individuals with whom you work. Uh, it is the exact same content, so if you did participate last week, uh, welcome back. Uh, but I will also apologize if it seems redundant because it is the same uh, presentation. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So today's is a little bit more detailed, specifically on the employment paper reporting, simply because in the red cap database that we're using for value-based payment, uh, it is also serving as the primary collection site for all of the data associated with employment pay for reporting. So that's why we have a more detailed session for this. So that way, hopefully employment providers are able to get a much more thorough understanding of how this website will work. So with that, uh, I'll move on to the next slide. So today's agenda is just a real brief overview of REDCap, uh, how to go about getting user access for REDCap, uh, ways to navigate uh, through wet REDCap, and then just how to access the individual uh, incentive data collection um, pages within that website. We'll go through and do a live demonstration. We won't do a super deep dive within each of the reports themselves, but we will bring them up. Uh, we'll kind of show the data that's being collected, but because much of those data is driven by business rules on how you will answer those questions, it's impossible for us to go through all potential um, you know, combinations and permutations, but we'll go through to where uh, each of the main highlighted content areas uh, are being covered for each of the five uh, employment services. Uh, then also, uh, we'll just do a little brief overview of the revised provider contract uh, language that is associated with this initiative, the data collection timeline, and then share resources uh, to better help you learn how to navigate REDCap. As Kat said, if you would, please ask your uh, questions in the chat box. Please uh, include that to be to all panelists, uh, as we also have Rachel Matheny on, who is one of our research analysts, and she is the architect of the REDCap site. So if you uh, post questions in the chat box, please select all panelists so both Rachel and I can see those questions. Okay, so REDCap, uh, what is REDCap? Um, you've heard us talk a lot about REDCap over the last couple of months. REDCap Cap is simply just an online data collection tool. Uh, it's a site that many institutions of higher ed and other public agencies use to collect data. And so essentially it's a secure website that uh, individual users are granted access to uh, using their own uh, individually assigned user accounts. You can add it to your uh, favorites in your web browser. So in that way, each quarter when you're completing employment reporting, you can simply go back to that um, favorites web browser uh, tab, bring it open, uh, log back in, and then complete your reporting. Again, it is a fully secure website, um, and um, it's one that is able to be accessed through desktops, uh, tablets, as well as smartphones. So to request user access, uh, the hyperlink that appears on the page is the link that one would use to get access. Now the portal itself is not opening until um, next Tuesday, the 17th. Uh, so if you do attempt to uh, select that link currently, uh, you won't actually be able to um, have a user account uh, created yet, uh, but uh, that is where you would want to visit next Tuesday to begin doing uh, uploading of information into the Red Cat portal. Uh, there's also a QR code that can be used uh, in addition to the hyperlink. And on this screen, what it's also showing on the right hand side is when you go in for the first time as a provider agency, uh, it's going to ask you to enter your contact name, uh, your first name, your last name, as well as your email address, and then your job title. And that's information that's collected. So if we do have questions, about any of the reports that are uploaded and entered that we know who to contact to uh, clean up uh, what may be uh, some, um, you know, accidental uh, data entry. 
<clears throat> so when you get to the red cap site, and we will show this in a little bit more uh, detail uh, later, but when you get to the red cap site, you'll see at the top where it'll say my projects. Uh, when you click my projects, then uh, you'll get to see a list of the various uh, value based payment incentives uh, that you have request access for. So when you're requesting your user access, you will also indicate which of the value based payments that you're requesting access for to be able to complete data entry. So for today's example, we are talking about the employment pay for reporting. And so you'll see the second line on the screen here. Uh, first one shows ISL tier supports and city payments. And the second one is the employment pay for reporting. But again, each of the uh, incentives will appear for those which you've requested access for. Once you select the incentive that you're updating records for, you'll uh, select add edit records. And then once you do that, you'll have a pop-up that says add new record. You'll select that. And then you will actually be into that particular incentive and it will identify for you uh, that you need to select the reporting time period for which you're completing data collection on. Uh, and then you can begin to see uh, each of the other corresponding forms that you will need to complete. Um, and we, again, we'll go through this a little bit more detail when we do the live demonstration. So again, in navigating REDCap, uh, it's just a simple matter of doing add and uh, edit records. Once you have an initial record in there, uh, it will give you the opportunity to go back and continue to add to that particular record. And simply, you know, each new quarter, you would just go back into that same record, select the new quarter for which you're completing reporting for, and then begin to add to it. So you would not need to reselect your provider information on multiple times. And I see in the chat box a question inquiring if these slides and instructions will be shared with everyone. Uh, these will be uploaded to the training hyperlink uh, that uh, Kat uh, posted in the chat box. So when you go to that hyperlink, not only will you be able to view the recording of this, but you'll also be able to get a copy of this PowerPoint. And once we get the uh, Q&A documents completed, those will also be housed there as well as a copy of the transcript of today's webinar. So with REDCap, uh, we have tested it in both Edge and Chrome. Uh, so that is the preferred browser to be using when, when accessing it. Uh, there are training videos that are available out there that have been developed by REDCap that you can complete. And the other thing within REDCap is there is this ability to be able to identify whether you fully completed all the data in each, um, in each template or not. Uh, when the red light appears on the dashboard, that means that there's still additional work that needs to be completed. Uh, when you have completed all the data elements uh, and save it, you'll get the green light indicating that it has been completed. The yellow unverified is a feature that is available in case you have staff or you yourself are entering data that someone above you is needing to verify it for your agency to ensure that you have accurate information. If that is something that you elect to use, uh, then you can select it to be unverified. So that way a supervisor or a program manager uh, would know that you've completed all your information. You're just asking them to go in and verify the information. And again, we'll kind of demo that uh, in the live uh, demonstration. So when we talk about employment paper reporting, this is a value-based payment incentive that is eligible for all of our contracted employment service providers. So any provider who is delivering career planning, job development, benefits planning, pre-vocational or support employment services would be eligible for this value-based payment incentive. Uh, the incentive is $55 for each report that is completed and thoroughly uploaded um, each quarter. Uh, it is available for each individual service or each DMH ID. So if you have a waiver recipient who is receiving three employment services, Within, within a particular quarter, the provider would go in, complete a report for those three particular services for that single DMH ID. In that circumstance, the provider would be eligible for $165 payment for that particular quarter. So again, if uh, an individual is receiving two services, you can do uh, the, the report for each of the two services they're doing. If they've received three, four, or five, 
uh, you know, you would complete a report for each of those services uh, or procedure codes on each DMH ID with whom you're working. So obviously, if you are a provider that's working with 10, 15, 20 individuals in employment services, and they're each receiving multiple employment services, you can begin to see how the incentive uh, amount of incentive payment would begin to stack. Okay, so as we get into the employment reporting, uh, this particular screen, uh, this is what you would see after you've created user access and you go in uh, to begin to complete it. Uh, you'll see on the screen all of the information that uh, one might be eligible to complete. And then you can also see that it also identifies the different quarters in which you would be completing those uh, reports. One of the first things within each of them uh, that would need to be done the very first time of logging in is to provide your provider information. In this circumstance, what you'll do is after you have your user access, uh, you'll like click a drop down box. That drop down box will have a list of all the applicable providers for this particular value based payment incentive. Uh, you'll find your provider name, select that name, and then uh, you will also identify. Uh, your first name, um, as well as the uh, phone number and email of the person completing the report. And then at the bottom, when that's all completed, you simply choose the drop down to complete and save and exit the form. And the provider information has now been uh, completed for that particular um, reporting. When it comes to uploading individual information, waiver participant information, that particular screen, you will simply enter the DMH ID, the individual's first name and last name, and then mark that as complete. So in this example, uh, what you can see is uh, an individual has now gone in, they've uploaded uh, a individual waiver participant. So on the left side of the home screen, you will see the DMH ID. Uh, in this test case, there's not actually a name, it's just a series of numbers. Uh, but you will see the DMH ID as well as the individual's uh, name. Uh, then you can see with the green lights that the individual has already completed their provider information, as well as uploaded the individual waiver participants, DMH ID on which they're reporting. And now you can see each quarter uh, that would be available for reporting, and you can see each of the five um, employment services listed. So were you, if you wanted to go in and begin to work on benefits planning, uh, you would uh, simply click on the button for benefits planning for the first quarter that is listed. And once that's clicked, uh, it will take you into the individual benefits planning report. Uh, at the top of all of our uh, reporting templates, uh, one of the first questions is whether or not the individual has uh, ended the service. So again, if someone received billing during the quarter, but they discontinued for uh, any particular reason, whether it was uh, Successfully, they're no longer interested, or unfortunately, if they passed, uh, you know, we ask that very first question on if the individual has ended the service within that quarter or not. When you select yes or no there, then it will begin to pull in additional questions uh, that um, follow the business rules as to whether a person is continuing to receive a service or not. At the bottom of each screen, there's also an area for provider attestation. And this is where the person who's uploading the information will type in their first and last name, as well as select the date of entry. And then they will click the green uh, area that says add signature and a window will pop open uh, for the ability to you to do an electronic signature. Again, we will demo each of these uh, shortly. So within career planning, this is a separate, separate uh, report template. Uh, again, it's got the same first question. And you can begin to see how the amount and type of content associated with each report is beginning to vary a little bit based upon the billable activities associated with that service definition. On this screen uh, is just a brief little screenshot of the job development. Uh, again, it looks very similar to career planning, but the billable activities listed are slightly different because again, it corresponds with the billable activities outlined in the uh, job development service definition, which are different than what was contained within the career planning. 
service definition. With pre-vocational, uh, again, a little bit additional information um, around start date and the uh, specific skills that are being developed and a measure of where the individual is at in uh, progress towards developing that skill. And then in support employment, uh, there are questions you know, that are going to be focused on is the individual in a group or individual setting. Also, whether or not the individual continues to be employed, if they're employed at with multiple employers, uh, what types of benefits may be available from that employer. And then towards the bottom of the screen, it begins to get into the specific skills that are being developed and how the individual is progressing towards that skill development. So with that, we are going to walk away from the um, PowerPoint and we'll actually go into the website uh, to where we can actually demonstrate uh, how you would complete uh, each of these reports and more detailed information on each of these reports. So with that. Okay, so just confirmation, Kat, we're seeing my screen now. Yes, we see the Google screen right now. Okay, thank you. So I've bookmarked REDCap as one of my favorite sites. So when I select REDCap, uh, it will ask me for my username. Uh, for me, my username is my email address, and then it will ask me for my password. I that in correctly. Uh, I'm now inside the REDCap database. So once here, uh, as we talked about in the PowerPoint, there's a um, selection option that says my projects. When you're within my projects, then you will see each of the value-based payment incentives, which you have requested access for. You might, uh, first time of entering, you might actually appear at this home page. If that's the case, then you just simply select my projects and it will take you to this screen. So you can see that you're, who you're logged in as, uh, which should only be your information. And then you also see you have the ability to log out uh, upon completion. So for this demonstration, we are doing the employment pay for reporting. So I will select employment pay for reporting. And at this point in time, I'm now getting to this uh, large screen that's telling me that this is the Division of Developmental Disabilities uh, webpage for value-based payment employment reporting. It looks very busy, but again, if you simply go to add edit records, it will take you into the first screen where you will add a new record. So when you add a new record, as we discussed earlier, uh, it will let you know what you need to be completing. The first thing that has a button appearing is provider information. So in this uh, circumstance, I would select that. And now I come to a screen that's asking me to enter my provider name. So I will select just for the purposes of the example, abilities at first. So it pulls their name in. I will type my name into the uh, contact. I'll enter my phone number, my email address, and then I'll mark it as complete. And save and exit. And now it takes me back to this screen and you can now see the provider information has the green light indicating that all information has been fully completed. And now you'll notice that there is a button uh, to be able to enter an individual's DMH ID. So when I select that button, I'm now uh, taken back into the template. I will just simply enter in the individual's DMH ID for whom I'm reporting. And for demonstra demonstration purposes, uh, we'll just say this individual's ID number is all ones. Uh, I will type in the individual's first name, and in this example, we'll say the individual's name is Rocky, and that his last name is Pluto. Uh, again, it does remember uh, previous data that's been entered. That's why I have the ability to select it uh, through autofill. But the first time that you enter this database, you may need to actually, uh, or you will need to actually type in the information. So once I've entered that, uh, I'm going to accidentally forget to mark this as complete. So when I hit save and exit, it takes me back to my home screen, but you'll see that this is red light, meaning that I have forgotten to complete an activity. So when I go back into that red light, um, and when I select complete, 
and save an exit. It'll ask me for a reason for change. And I'll say, um, forgot to complete. Save an exit. And now you will see that that light is green as well. So at this point in time, I've now successfully for calendar year or fiscal year 23, I've now successfully entered my provider's information as well as a single waiver participants DMH ID number. Again, this DMH ID number is only needed for the employment pay for reporting because we are collecting at the individual level. You'll also notice on the screen that at the top here, it's showing me the record number in red cap. It's showing me this individual's DMH ID number as well as their name and my provider agency. The other thing that you will notice is now these additional buttons have become available. And that's because I've now completed successfully my provider information and my DMH ID number. And it's only given me the ability to complete data entry for those applicable reporting quarters. So I can't go out and begin to complete forms in the future. I can only be completing forms which are available during this reporting period. So when our reporting period opens on January 17th, uh, you will be able to enter data and receive payment for services delivered from July 1st through September 30th, as well as services that were delivered from October 1st to December 31st. And I am going to, I'm not able to see the chat. So um, Kat uh, or Rachel, if there is any questions that arise in the chat, just please interrupt me. So now uh, I'm going to go in and complete, let's say this individual will receive benefits planning during July through September uh, of fiscal year 23, which would be last year. So July 1st through September 30th of 22. When I click benefits planning, you will see that I'm now uh, in uh, on the individual's record, uh, the red cap record number. And I'm going to get a series of questions that just asks me, has the individual ended benefits planning? And let's say that the individual did complete that. When I select yes, you'll now see that when I selected that, that a series of additional questions opened up. So if I go back and reset that, let's say I selected that on accident, I just hit reset on the screen. And then I can go back and select yes again, and you'll see those questions that drop down. If the answer is no, they've not completed it. Uh, so far, you're seeing no additional questions pop open. So that's where uh, this top question that's in green is really going to drive, you know, uh, the additional questions that you may need to answer. So the individual did end services, and let's say the individual ended successfully. And what what do we mean by successfully? There's guidance language here that you'll see that says select yes if the outcomes identified in the service definition were accomplished. And so in the waiver manual and waiver application, the outcomes listed for benefits planning is that the individual had a completed benefits planning analysis and a recommendation on incentives to utilize. So if you've completed that particular outcome, meaning that they've successfully completed the benefits planning service, you will select yes. It'll ask for service start date and end date, uh, and you'll see the note. This is the first date in which billable activity occurred. Let's say that uh, for this individual, they started receiving benefits planning uh, July 11th. So I can scroll back, select that date, and let's say they completed it August 15th. Uh, again, this is auto-populating data from what I did at last week's webinar. But uh, if I'm going to put in August 15th, I can either use the calendar feature to scroll to that date, or I can simply enter the date uh, as well. So when I put the end date, you'll see that it automatically calculates the length of time in which the individual received that service. So this is looking at calendar days, which is fine. Um, the, uh, the main reason we're collecting this data for pay for reporting is that what we're wanting to do is have a repository of data to eventually uh, begin to move employment services from a 15 minute unit of service to outcome milestone and additional incentive payments. So that's why we're doing this extensive data collection 
is so we have the information we need for future rate methodology uh, to look at moving away from incremental units and paying whole dollar figures based upon activities that have been completed. So it automatically calculates the number of calendar days that the individual received. Uh, it'll ask for the number of units delivered this reporting period. And let's say the individual received 40 units of benefits planning. And then it's gonna ask, uh, what's the number of cumulative units delivered during the service? So if this individual happened to have received 20 units prior to this reporting period, then what I would do is add that 20 units to the 40 units and I'd be putting in a total of 60. If the individual had no prior units of service prior to this reporting period, that number would simply be the same as the prior number. Then we're gonna put in what the individual's earnings goal is. So I've completed benefits planning and let's say I've identified that I would like to have $780 a month of earnings. It's gonna ask is the individual currently employed and if yes, you'll see it's going to ask the number of hours they're working and what is their currently hourly earnings. If it's no, uh, those questions disappear. If it's unknown, you can also see those questions don't appear. So let's say that the individual completed benefits planning and they are now employed. And let's say that they're working 20 hours a week and that their current earnings are, sorry. Let's say they're twelve dollars and fifty cents an hour. Uh, it's going to ask what type of actions did I take as part of benefits planning to verify their actual benefits, so that way I can be informed in what I'm telling them. Uh, we'll check the applicable uh, resources that I used uh, to verify benefits, and then it's going to ask, as outlined in the service definition, was a benefits summary analysis completed? And I'll select yes or no. Uh, was a work incentive plan completed? I'll check yes or no. And then it's going to ask what work incentives were reviewed or recommended as part of the service delivery. And so you would check all that are applicable. If none were reviewed, you'd select none. Um, if you don't know uh, what you've reviewed with the individual, you would select unknown. Uh, if there's another incentive uh, from Social Security that you may have reviewed that's not in this list, then you would select other and you would type in what that incentive was. It's also going to ask, were any work incentives actually accessed as a result of that guidance provided through benefits planning? Again, these are the same list of the ones that you may have recommended. So then you'll identify the ones that may have actually been accessed. And it will ask whether or not the individual is utilizing or had recommendations to utilize an ABLE account, yes or no. And then uh, upon completion of the benefits planning, what service will the individual be transitioned to? So you have each of the waiver funded services listed here. Maybe they're moving on to both rehab or rehab services to the blind. Maybe they're going to college or a trade school, but you'll select which service the individual will be transitioned to. So since this individual uh, is employed in the example that we've provided, we're gonna say he's moving on to support an employment individual. The last question is, uh, what percent of the service was delivered using virtual delivery? Uh, let's say 25% of the units, uh, we actually met with the individual through Zoom or, or uh, Microsoft Teams, so we'll select that. And then we have the attestation language. I'll type in my name. I'll put today's date as when it was completed, and then I will do my electronic signature. Save my signature, mark it as complete, because I believe I've completed everything, and then I will save and exit. And it's actually telling me that I forgot to complete a field, so I can either ignore that, leave the record, and if I do that, I'll go back to that home screen and it'll give me a red light saying that, um, that I forgot to complete something, or I can say okay, and then I can go back in and realize that I did not select an answer here. Uh, so I'll select an answer here, go back, save and exit. Reasons for updating the change, save it, 
And now you'll see that this is green lighted also. So, uh, if the individual happened to receive career planning, we would now move into career planning. Similar to before, we're going to indicate whether or not the individual ended the service or not, whether they completed it successfully or not. We're going to put in the start date, which is the first billable date of activity. We will enter in the um, service end date if they completed it. So in this circumstance, let's say that he started services August 22nd and that he successfully completed services uh, September 20th. Again, it's auto calculating the length of time of career planning. We'll put the number of units delivered during this reporting period. And let's say we delivered 180 units of career planning. Um, in this example that we're doing with Rocky, uh, again, there were no prior units delivered before this reporting period. So again, we would just put the same 180 in. And then we'll get to this field where it's going to ask us, what are the activities that you did as part of career planning? So we have community resource mapping. Uh, community based assessment paid, community based assessment unpaid, discovery interviews, facility based assessment, uh, kind of a situational assessment of maybe observing a receptionist or a, a secretary at your provider agency. Uh, it could have been a, a facility based assessment where you actually administered the paper pencil test or did some kind of online interest inventory. Um, informational interview would be where you've spoken with a business about the job to help the individual better understand it, um, whether or not a job shadow was completed or other activities. We will be creating a crosswalk with an operational definition of what falls within each of these activities. So what you'll do is you'll enter the distinct number of events completed during that reporting period. So what we're going to say in this circumstance is that Rocky did Three unpaid community based assessments. Uh, two discovery interviews were completed, maybe one with parents, one with a special ed teacher. Uh, that we did not have any facility based assessments. We might have done three informational interviews with businesses, and we may have done four job shadows. Then, what we're going to indicate is how many uh, days were spent on those activities. So, in the three community based assessments, Rocky might have spent Two days at each of those sites, so that would be a, a matter of six combined days of community based assessment. Uh, the discovery interviews were both completed within one day, so that would be two days uh, for that. The informational interview, again, we'll say that those were each completed uh, within the same day. They didn't stretch over multiple days, so we'll say those were three days. And the job shadow, um, we'll say that two of them lasted three hours or excuse me three days so two of them lasted three days that would be a combined eight days in which uh job shadowing occurred. we get to the next questions on will the individual be seeking competitive integrated employment uh you know hopeful everybody who completes career planning is planning to move forward to competitive integrated employment but maybe as part of this process they've learned that they need to be working on other skills uh, or maybe they're not quite ready yet for employment. Uh, so there are instances where people could successfully complete and decide not to move forward with competitive integrated employment. Uh, but in this instance, we're going to say Rocky is uh, continuing to file forward. You know that he's got a, uh, an interest and uh, the planning team is all supportive. And so we're going to move forward. Um, if we select no, uh, a different set of questions will appear than when we select yes. So again, we'll be asked a series of questions on what was the job goal. We'll say it's food service. Uh, the individual, what service will they be transitioning to? In this circumstance, we'll say that Rocky's going to be getting job development to help him find a job. And Rocky might be doing some pre-vocational services to work on some basic skills, maybe around task attendance and following directions. Uh, it's going to ask us at the completion of career planning, what is his desired wage? And we'll say Rocky through career planning, we've decided he wants to earn $13 an hour and work 10 hours uh, a week. 
We're going to identify what types of supports Rocky may need as we've completed career planning. And let's say that he is going to need support for job coaching, uh, job interviewing assistance. He might need some assistance with resume development and transportation. Uh, but you would just select what needs were identified in career planning. And again, this justifies why you may be authorizing additional services and delivering additional services. Again, we'll get to the question about virtual delivery of services, and we'll say that all of this was done in person. Then we get to the question of whether job exploration interview and career planning profile completed. That is an outcome expectation and service definition. And we did that, so we're going to mark yes. Uh, was a personal employment profile and job development plan completed? Uh, again, that is an expected outcome of the service. And we're going to say that we did that as well. And then we get back to the attestation. So once again, I'll simply type in my name. Today's date. Add my signature. And mark the form as complete. So this time I did not get an error message. So I did successfully complete all information. And when you get here, that's verified in the fact that this is now a green light. So I'm going to take just a brief breather here and get a drink. That's my my voice is starting to go. Uh, but Kat, can you confirm? Are there any questions yet on benefits planning, career planning, entering in DMHIDs, or the provider information? Um, my question did come through. You should see it. Um, if not, I can read it to you. Will there be opportunity for providers to use a test individual? In the red cap system in order to get familiar with each of the required data elements for each level of service. If not, is there a different way we can access templates for each service area and the related data elements questions to be addressed? Okay, excellent question. So, um, we did have these system or sites open for test data with our advisory group. Uh, for about a period of four to six weeks. Uh, currently, I think the test site is closed. Um, what we can do is um, copy as a PDF these sites uh, for individuals. But what, next week, when you go in and uh, uh, are created initial access, you can navigate through the sites just simply to kind of view them uh, and not worry about putting in data. But at this point in time, we would not want any test data put in. I mean, we would actually want only actual live data. And I will pause there. Rachel, I don't know if you're actually where you can speak, but can you just validate what I just said? We're, we're not creating an additional test site, correct? Right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, it does allow you to download a PDF when you go into it. So you could easily just sign in and download a PDF if you wanted to. Um, if there are other questions, you know, please continue to put them in the chat box and, uh, Kat, I don't actually have the chat open where I can see it with me sharing my screen. So if there are any, uh, you know, just, uh, please point orient me, uh, to those. Okay. So we're now, um, looking at job development and we're going to say that, uh, Rocky, although he completed career planning during the quarter of July 1st to September 30th that he actually did not begin job development until the next quarter. So if he began uh, job development, we'll say October 10th, I'm gonna move over now to the next quarterly reporting period and select that reporting period. And it'll show here at the top that we're now entering information in for fiscal year quarter two, which is October 1st through December 31st. So in job development, same question, uh, has the individual into job development? Yes or no? In this circumstance, we're gonna say uh, that um, he has not ended it. And so when I say no, uh, again, no additional questions popped up. Had I said yes, you'll see that additional questions popped up. Again, the standard question of at the end, did he successfully end? But for this example, we're gonna say no. Um, service start date, and again, this is the first date in which billable activity occurred. If my memory is correct, I think I said October 10th. 
So we'll select October 10th, the units bill for this period. Uh, maybe Rocky has had uh, 40 units. So far this period, there were no previous units delivered because they started within this period. So that number would remain the same. And then similar to career planning, I'm going to go in and now indicate the number of events in which I've done each of these activities and the number of days in which those events have stretched across. Uh, again, this would be not calendar days, but the number of days in which that particular activity was completed. You can also see that these activities are different here than what it was in career planning because in the service definition, allowable billable activities are different. So in career planning, uh, as an example, these were things such as discovery interview, job shadowing, community-based assessment. Uh, now it's directing you to only those activities that are allowed within the job development service definition. So again, you will see a lot of job development specific activities, such as application submitted, employer meetings, employers contacted, uh, job interviews, job shadowing, trials, uh, mock interviews, task analysis or job analysis of potential jobs, video resumes that may have been developed or other. Again, we will provide you a crosswalk of operational definitions here on what each of these uh, mean. When we talk about an employer meeting, this would mean an active participation with an employer. So you've actually set up a meeting to go in and conduct job development and try and support the individual to be hired or to coordinate an interview. An employer contact would simply be a passive connection with an employer. So that would be an email, uh, just a telephone call um, activity. Uh, and so that's kind of what that difference is on those um, criteria. So again, you'll go through, you'll indicate the number of distinct events. So maybe there were four distinct times that you met with an employer. There might have been two job interviews. And let's say that one mock interview was completed uh, to help Rocky improve how he might answer those interview questions. So if I've entered that information in, I need to indicate the number of days spent on that activity. Uh, so there might have been um, you know, six days combined uh, of meeting with that employer. I may have met with an employer multiple times. Um, over that time, uh, the number of job interviews, rarely would that ever not be the same amount of days as the number of events, but um, uh, so the job interview occurred, each one occurred within the same day in which the uh, interview occurred. You know, they weren't multiple days long interviews. And then the mock interview, uh, it also occurred just within one calendar day. So at this point in time, I've Updated on the status of the completion. I put the date that the billable service started, the number of units delivered, the activities that we've delivered, the number of days of those activities. I'll read the attestation language, type my name in. Do submission date. And I'm going to act like I forgot to do my ad signature. Um, and so I'm going to mark complete, exit the form. And again, I'll get that reminder that says some fields are needed that I understand that I need to do the attestation language. So I'm gonna say, okay, and then I'll be taken back in uh, to that. Okay, in this example, uh, we'll say that I actually have a uh, program manager who is wanting to verify what I've put in. So this is where you can select if that's a, a feature that you would like to use at your agency, you can have the person doing the primary data entry uh, select unverified. And the reason this changed was we added signature both correctly. And I'll save and exit. And now you see that this is a yellow light. So this does give you a level of assurance um, if you're going to uh, verify what staff have entered, if you're going to have uh, maybe more direct support professional staff enter the initial data, and that as a program manager, you may just be going in to do the final review before it being completed. That's where you could have individuals mark unverified. 
So when I go back into the yellow, let's say I realized, oops, this person made a mistake. The individual really did complete the service. So I can go in and change it to yes, they did end the service. Yes, they did become employed. And then I can save an exit form. Okay, and so now it's telling me that we have additional fields that are needed. And if I select OK, what happened is because I indicated the person successfully into the job, uh, or excuse me, completed the service and that they were successful with the service which means that they became employed. I'm now needing to go back and enter in uh, the start date of the service, the end date of the service, as well as additional information. So this speaks to the value of why you may want to have staff select unverified. Uh, is so that way, if there are mistakes, you can go back and correct those. Um, so it's going to ask us, has the individual secured employment? Yes. And now I'm getting all these questions about employment of where, you know, what was the job goal? We're going to say food service. Rocky is working the 12 hours a week. He's earning $12 an hour. Uh, he does not have any workplace benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, the job implementation plan was completed and the supports that he's going to need is job coaching. So had I initially indicated yes on both of these, these questions would have appeared. But again, this is where if you're having other staff maybe do the data, you may want to use that unverified feature. So you do have that ability to go back in and uh, review the data for accuracy and then enter in additional information to correct the information. Okay, so now when I leave, you'll see, um, oops, actually, I've got some something that's still telling me I haven't done something. So let me see what I may have missed here. And this is what happens when you do live demos is, oh, what I forgot to do was mark it as complete. You do have one question. Okay. Blaine. Is VBP going to be applied to other services in the future, or is it just about services related to individuals gaining employment and employment skills? Uh, another excellent question. Right now, uh, it is focused on uh, the employment programming and services simply because we've been working with our uh, employment advisory team for about seven, eight years now on getting it moved over to an outcome incentive and milestone uh, payment process. Uh, the main reason we want to move that out of um, a quarter hour unit of service is just like in the example we've given with Rocky. If I have done a great job of providing timely service to Rocky to where he's completed benefits planning, career planning, quickly secured a job and is now employed, what happens under a quarter hour unit of service is as a provider, I'm actually getting to build less units and get less money for having accomplished the desired outcome. Whereas if I took long periods of time to complete career planning, was ineffective in job development, or maybe struggled in finding businesses who wanted to hire Rocky, the longer it takes me to deliver those services, I'm actually receiving more money. And so with employment, you know, we want to ensure that we are paying in a way that incentivizes the intended outcome. So that's why we're doing this initially with employment services is so that, uh, again, down the road, uh, you know, two years, three years, four years, uh, we have all this data collection so we can see what activities lead to employment, what the average time frames are uh, for people to successfully complete each of the services to where we can begin to work with our actuarial company, uh, with our stakeholders on developing um, flat amounts of payment 
So as an example, what we might do down the road is when someone completes career planning, you would authorize a single code of maybe $3,000. And when the person completes that, no matter how long it takes them to complete it, the provider would receive a flat amount payment. So the short-term intent is to focus us specifically on employment services. Um, and uh, right now we are using this as the initial um, program area uh, before you know looking at any other areas down the road. Okay, so um, pre-vocational, uh, you can see this light move from yellow to green. So we now successfully completed everything there. Uh, if we were doing pre-vocational uh, in this example, uh, again, same type of information, yes or no, if they've ended it, did they do it successfully or not? Um, the start date of the billable activity, uh, the end date of the billable activity, the end date will not appear if we say that the individual has not successfully ended the service. So if I go back and reset that and say they've not ended the service, you'll see that that end date no longer appears. Um, so again, series of questions, uh, but I wanna take a little bit more time in, in reviewing here uh, is not all the possible answers that could pop up, but what I do wanna point out is for pre-vocational is where you'll begin to see this type of grid. So again, what we've done here in pre-vocational is we've identified from the service definition and from CMS's technical assistance, what are the skills that are able to be developed in pre-vocational services? Each of those skills are listed uh, in a box here. So in pre-vocational, you're able to develop skills relating to accepting feedback, attendance punctuality, communication skills, following directions, grooming and hygiene, mobility and motor skill training, social skills, task performance, uh, workplace protocols, workplace safety. So if an individual is developing or working on that skill as part of pre-vocational, you'll need to go through and select yes or no for the individual skills that are being developed. And if there's another skill that's being developed, then that's where you would enter in what that skill is or skills. Uh, and then you would select, you know, yes, that you are developing another skill that we've not listed. So once you've selected yes uh, on any one of these areas, uh, you'll have to go indicate what was the baseline uh, that the individual was demonstrating. So if we're saying we're accepting or developing a skill on accepting feedback, that means that there was growth needed and that it was identified as being something that would limit the individual's ability to move forward with employment. So at this point in time, we're gonna say that Rocky is only demonstrating the ability to accept feedback um, less than 25% of the time. And as we're working in pre-vocational, uh, Rocky has currently gotten to a point where he's now demonstrating that 26 to 50% of the time that we're working with them on that skill. You also have to identify what is the targeted threshold. Uh, maybe the threshold is only that it's gonna be done 26 to 50% of the time. Uh, you know, Rocky may not need to always demonstrate the ability to accept feedback because maybe Rocky's working in a, uh, a work setting to where he's not gonna be receiving, you know, regular and ongoing feedback. Uh, but if Rocky is working in a setting where it needs to be fully developed, then we would select the target as uh, fully developed uh, with supports or fully developed without supports. So again, this is one of the things that we've really been trying to do a lot of training and technical assistance on over the last several years is that individuals should not really be in pre-vocational unless you've got a specific skill that's being developed. You know what the threshold is, uh, where the individual is currently performing, which justifies why you're delivering pre-vocational and a measure of that current threshold. Again, these are all expectations that were updated in the current waiver uh, manual and waiver service definitions at the most recent renewal, which was in uh, September of 2021. Uh, so this shouldn't be new information, but if it is, uh, you know, uh, individuals should only be receiving pre-vocational if there's very specific skills that have been identified and we 
have an identification of what we're needing to develop that skill towards. So in these quarterly progress reports, you're just simply indicating the skills being developed and you're identifying what their current or what their initial baseline was when they started the service, what their current skill level is, and then what that targeted threshold is. Again, this is gonna vary for each individual uh, based upon what their capacity is, based upon maybe what type of work they're looking at, uh, or based upon the type of uh, uh, supports that they're gonna need. So again, each time you select yes as a skill being developed, you are required to go through and identify their developmental plans. Okay, so we've identified those for Rocky. I'm back to typing my name. Build it out today, adding my signature. This one I'm going to mark it as complete and I'm going to save and exit. The form. This one, it is telling me that I have a lot of things I have to go back and correct. So I'm going to select OK. And unfortunately, uh, whether you answer yes or no, uh, you do have to go through. Uh, and indicate this, but I thought we had this fixed. So this is why it's good to do live demo, uh, Rachel. Uh, do we actually have to select blank here? Let me go in and try to fix that. This is why it's good to have your uh, uh, development specialist on the call so they can look at uh, fixing that. But we'll get that we'll get that uh, fixed. That's just a uh, uh, design uh, issue. So ideally, you should not have to go select that. Uh, so we'll just have to look at whether or not these are required fields or not. Um, and we may only move this to a yes uh, versus yes no. But but we'll get that corrected. Okay. So the last service that we have not done yet and we're going to ignore and leave the record. Uh, the last one that we haven't done yet is support employment. So in support employment, again, it's identifying that we're in support employment in the top. Uh, we've got the same yes or no. It's going to ask us if they're a group of individual. Has the individual ended employment? Yes or no. Uh, if yes, you're getting different questions than if the answer is no. Uh, and the type of questions and the answers that you have uh, here again are uh, if they uh, ended employment, uh, it's going to ask. Uh, so if they've ended employment, it's going to say what was the employment start date, uh, the employment end date, the date supports began, and what were the dates the supports ended. Um, if the individual is still employed, then you know you wouldn't be asked. Uh, on uh, employment end date uh, or when supports ended. Uh, if they did end, it's going to ask you for the type of employment separation. If they didn't end, it's not going to be asking that question. Uh, but if they did end employment, it'll again also ask what was the type of separation and what was the reason for separation. Because services were delivered, again, you'll go through and look at the skills that you may have been developing on the job. Uh, and you will identify uh, what the baseline was uh, during the report or at the beginning when the person started the service, what the current threshold is, and what their targeted threshold is. Then at the bottom, it's going to say, will the individual be continuing in another employment service? If you select yes, then it's going to ask what service, since in this instance, we said the person was discontinuing employment, uh, it's going to ask. Uh, do they still have general employment support needs? Uh, and what will be the service that the individual will be transitioning to? Uh, so again, uh, it's, uh, are they gonna be transitioning to another employment service? And maybe they're not, uh, maybe it's not known or maybe they are moving on to another service and maybe they've discontinued employment because they lost it and they're moving to day have that. They just type in day have. Uh, Provider attestation again, typing in your name, the date you entered it, adding the signature, 
and marking as complete. Um, so I know we are approaching the top of the hour. Uh, we're going to have some errors there because I went through that one a little bit quicker. Uh, but it's the same business logic as the other reports and entering very similar information. What would be entered in with uh, career planning um, because it's about skill development on the job, whereas pre vocational is skill development and preparation of the job. So it's very similar types of questions. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop sharing that and go back to the presentation so we can get through this and have time available for any questions that uh, we're able to answer. So, Kat, are we back to sharing the PowerPoint, correct? Yes. Okay. So that that is the REDCap database site. Uh, when that site opens, as we will discuss in just a few seconds, you will have 45 days to go in and complete information for each of the reporting periods. And this first opening, you will actually be able to report for both the reporting period of July 1st through September 30th, as well as October 1st through December 31st. Uh, that is the only reporting period where you'll be able to step back and do two quarters. Uh, in all future reporting periods, you will only be able to complete data for the prior quarter. Uh, so the contract language that goes along with the corresponding waiver amendment that enables us to, to do the value-based payments, that like contract language has been uh, sent out. Um, providers will need to go through that contract language. Um, and just on this slide, we're identifying that the language in the contract specifies uh, that this particular value-based payment is eligible for contracted employment service providers as a quality payment to be completing quarterly reporting of data elements for future uh, value-based payment benchmarking. Uh, it clarifies that the quarterly reporting incentive is $55 per report uh, that is completed. Again, you can complete multiple reports if the individual has received multiple services within that quarter. Um, as noted, uh, this is the second of two uh, and the last of the two detailed uh, training sessions on the REDCap site. Uh, you can either go back into today's recording uh, once it gets posted, or you can go back to the recording on January 5th uh, to view that recording uh, as well as a PowerPoint of today's presentation, a transcript, and then a, a soon to be uploaded document of frequently asked questions. Uh, the data collection timeline for this, uh, the REDCap uh, site will open next Tuesday, January 17th. Uh, that portal will be open for 45 days uh, for reports to be entered. Uh, in future periods, uh, the uh, reporting site will always open the 15th of the second month of a quarter. Um, and you can see that it will remain open. Um, and I think we may have some misapplied dates here, but it, uh, it should be open each time for 45 days. So for the uh, January uh, reporting period, it would open February 1st. And I believe that actually should say March 15th. So uh, let me uh, get with federal programs and we may need to update this slide before we post it because it, I believe that the portal is always open 45 days. Uh, again, provider contracts uh, were distributed, I believe, last week. Uh, if there is any comment on those contracts themselves, uh, those comments should be submitted to the DD mail at dmh.mo.gov with a subject line of BVP provider contract. Uh, but please note that no incentive payments will be made until that revised contract has been signed and returned to the department and deemed effective. Uh, questions about value-based payment data collection, whether it's employment pay for reporting or any one of the other eight incentives. If you have questions about that, uh, again, email the DD email at dmh.mo.gov. Uh, but this time with a subject line of VVP data collection, and we will respond to those questions. All right, uh, that is it uh, for today's webinar, and I can now see the chat box again. So let me see if there's other questions. 
that have been asked. Okay, so, um, so again, the slides will be uploaded to the uh, uh, training webinar link. I will repost that again, because if some have joined late, you may not be able to see uh, earlier chat box information. So I just posted in the link where you can find a recording, the PowerPoint, and any of the information that you may have missed. Um, let's see here. Uh, it, feel free to share the recording and slides with uh, any that you would like. Um, there's a question on, uh, is this used for residential providers to bill for first BBP? So um, it is the same red cap site. Uh, if you are eligible for the first BBP, uh, you would enter the red cap, with the same hyperlink. Uh, the first would appear on the original home screen, uh, and then you would select the Hearst. Uh, there are very different questions for the first because ultimately uh, the first is simply uh, attesting that it was completed. So it's um, much less questions, um, but uh, I, I will refrain from answering questions about the first uh, because uh, those would be best answered by Kim Stock, uh, who is overseeing that. And if, but if you have questions, uh, you can send it to the DD mail at dmh.mo.gov with the subject line BUP data collection, and uh, that will get routed to Kim Stock to answer that question. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Uh, so, uh, if you do have questions again, please uh, submit those to the DD mail at dmh.mo.gov. Uh, again, this portal will be open on uh, next Tuesday, uh, the 17th. And as uh, uh, questions arise, please do not hesitate to reach out or contact and I will put my email address in the chat box. Should there be questions uh, once you're trying to enter in data? What will happen and what I did not cover is once you've entered the information, uh, we'll have reviewers that will go in and review to ensure that all information was thoroughly completed. Uh, the reviewers will also just kind of look for logical answers. So if for some reason, uh, you know, someone puts in that an individual has a, a goal of working 1 million hours in a quarter, uh, you know, that won't be accepted and what would happen is there would be an email back to the person who uploaded that information to ask that they go in and fix that data field. Uh, so we will be looking for uh, kind of logical responses, uh, anything that you know kind of falls beyond what would be expected or anticipated. Um, we would be in contact with the person who did the data entry to update that before we would accept it as approved. Uh, once that review is completed, then the uh, Department of Mental Health reviewers will lock that uh, entry from further data entry. And at that point in time is when the payment would be processed. All right, uh, other questions? And Kat, I'm not seeing any others. So if anybody has uh, posted a question to just uh, you, I'll give you just a few seconds to confirm. No, there hasn't been any coming in that I have not posted. Okay. All right. Well, with that, we will conclude today's webinar. Thank you all very much.